in 1 Samuel chapter 16 and Psalm 78 as we turn our attention to Scripture. This is a familiar story, but I want to add to it some commentary from Psalm 78. So 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 11 and 12, to remind you of the setting here, Saul is king over Israel. He is king, but he, is, he has been, while in office, rejected by God. God says, no more. You have disobeyed me. You have lifted up yourself, even though I lifted you from nothing. So he has rejected him. He calls the prophet of, of God to do a seditious thing, to commit an act of treason, to go and anoint someone else to be king in Saul's place. Samuel obeys. He goes to the house of Jesse. Jesse assembles seven of his sons. Samuel said to Jesse, after he had reviewed them all, and God says, no, 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 not this one, no, and no. Samuel said to Jesse, are all the young men here? Then Jesse said, There remains yet the youngest. And there he is, keeping the sheep. I guess he's where Jesse thinks he ought to be. Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. So Jesse sent and brought him in. He was ready, with bright eyes, and good looking. And the Lord said, notice, not Jesse said, not Samuel said, the Lord said, arise and anoint him, for this is the one. Father, as we come to your house today, we come once again with this topic. It does not matter where we've come from. It does not matter how we arrived here. It doesn't matter our past. It only matters our future. What matters is where we are going. Dear God, there's nothing we can do about the past this day. Not one thing. The best thing we could ever do is hand our past over to you and say, God, cleanse all my sin and give me life everlasting. But dear God, not a thing we can do to change it. But oh Lord, today is the day of a saved life. Today is the day to embrace it wholeheartedly. Today is the day to say, I will live my utmost for God. For there is no better day than today. No better time to get to the most important place to go than this day. So I pray, dear God, that you would enforce this, I pray that you reinforce this, this truth into our hearts so that, God, we may understand it. And then, Father, looking forward, we may have eyes that will truly see what really matters. And thank you, for, Father, for it. In Jesus' holy name, amen. TB, if you'll show us once again. I want to know who thought this was a good idea. Don't you feel for the baby? The baby had no choice. Uh, husband either, okay. Well, now. It does not matter where you're going. It does not matter where you came from, but it does matter where you are going. I want to talk about being overlooked. Now, this is a family that's, that, that's hard to overlook, but they'll probably try at least parts of them for the rest of their lives, but let's think about being overlooked. One of the most difficult things about being a kid, if we all remember being a kid, is, is if you ever got any money, you ever got any money being a kid? And when you got money, you go to the store and you're going to do it yourself. I'm going to pay for this myself. I'm going to get it myself. And you go up to the counter and you go in a line and they keep waiting on people. I don't see you there. Wow, you're just a kid. 
What do you have? They look, look over you. They'll take on adults. And as I see myself as an adult, I see the same thing happening. I see them look to me and they forget this child that's standing in front of me. They, they forget the children around me. They easily overlook because they have, even in that, that subtle service, they have shown who they feel is important. They don't think the kids have any money. Now, that may be true of people that, that wait on you, but it's not true of people who have a little bit more uh, power in the commercial industry. They know where to put the cereals in the grocery stores. They know what level that kid sits on, what will be easy for him to grab out. Those on TV, you come Christmas time or Easter time, you're going to see every toy imaginable pop up on that screen in every way possible because they know the kids may not have the money, but they will get those parents to fork out that money for them. So we understand, we understand from, from the, the, the facts of our lives, it is easy to be overlooked. It's easy to be discounted in some way. And that's why David is such a perfectly perfect picture for us of what it means. Just because he was David, we think, oh, David. But then it was David? That was that was the attitude. He's the youngest. He's well, he's nobody. He's just tending sheep, and that's all he's good for. He's the youngest. I got big boys. I got strong boys. I got smart boys. I got capable boys. Of course one of them will be God's choice. David simply doesn't matter. David was, like I say, the odd man out. So, so that first letter of odd would be David was overlooked. But I want to share with you throughout history as I go through this that this is a common truth that happens all throughout history, not just in your history or biblical history. Uh, we can remember there was, there was a child that was the seventh child, and he was really the only second one still living. His siblings had died before him. One was born, died. Five were born. All of them died. Finally, there was a child born, the, the sixth child, it was a girl, and she was born and, and, she, and she did fairly well. Seventh child, it's the seventh child. So many have died. What chance do you give that person? How, how easy do you think? Well, not going to matter. But in that case, we ought to learn that every child matters. Every life is important. Don't overlook any life that is so easy to do, especially for our children. Overlook their worth. I don't need them. They're too much of a bother. They too much impair me. But if this family had taken that attitude, then we would have never had Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart to be one of the greatest composers that history, human history, has ever known. You can't overlook any of God's creations. We do it at our own peril. But what Jesse and what others show in this is they have preference. Why wasn't David there? Preference. Why wasn't David brought forward? Preference. Why was he chosen to take care of the sheep when everybody else was meeting the prophet? Preference. Jesse's preference was that David remain out of the loop. But how many do you know that just because it's man's preference doesn't mean it's God's preference? Just because that's how man sees you or people see you or even society as a whole sees you does not mean that's how God sees you. Yes, you and I will be overlooked in our lives, not only when we're young, but we'll also be overlooked when we're old as well. It happens to all of us at all stages of life. And the problem is we begin to think that's our identity. We begin to think their preference must really matter, so I need to think about myself in that way. That's the stuff of counseling of the future. That's the stuff of train wrecks and problems and of all sorts of variety. When you believe other people's hype about you, it can certainly impair your life when you are overlooked. But kind of overlooked goes along with something else. D, I will say, is disrespected. Wasn't David disrespected? Wasn't he equally a son of the church? Was he a lesser son? Was he a stepson? No. There's no way in any way, shape, or form David was not equal to every boy that was born in that family, but he of all was disrespected because of his youth. Disrespected because of who he was. Disrespected simply because he came in the wrong birth order. And that's what it gets down to. Disrespect. But isn't the world really good at that? Our 
we glad the internet was invented? I'm torn. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it gives us access to a lot of things. Sure, I mean you could you could you could surf the the wide world while you're sitting here in church. You better not be doing that. <laughs> Do that later. But then you see people talk from all over the world too, and you realize, is this what people are really like? Is this what happens when the masks come off? Is this how people really are? Oh, they look like they're smiling. The people walking around me, they look really nice and good. But is that how they really think? Because they're ugly. There's a lot of ugly, 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 ugly people that will say the ugliest of things to people they don't know. Simply because they can hide behind a computer screen or a tablet. And it's not, it doesn't just happen outside the walls of the church. We got a shooter that was a good member of the evangelical church. He wasn't listening to his sermons, but he was listening to other voices that resonated in his heart. And he decided to disrespect those of another religion and to enact violence upon them. So disrespect, it goes a long way and it, it happens a lot. As a kid, this boy loved basketball. Knew he wanted to make a career out of it. He was just gotten into high school and the varsity was almost chosen except for one person. And there was a choice between him and one other guy. And this five foot ten basketball player was said, no, it's not your time. Stay on the junior varsity squad. And so for one more year, Michael Jordan was not known to the world as one of the greatest to ever play the game. Disrespected and overlooked, but it doesn't mean that's what their true worth was. Let me add one more D to our, to our acrostic here. Denied. David was denied access to the prophet. See, this works both ways. Not only was David not invited, but David had a wall put up. You stay in the field, we'll stay here. You go out there and we'll do our business here. And when the adults are finished talking, then we'll tell you what happened. I love how Samuel treats us. He says, We're the, there's nothing more important right now. No more chit-chat, no more nothing. We're not going to sit down until you go get him. Because he will not be disbarred. He will be brought in. He will not be excluded. He will be a part. He will not be denied. And he doesn't know that he's God's choice yet. Look in the scriptures. He doesn't know it yet, but he says you will not choose for him if he's God's anointed or not. You will not make the choice. That's God's choice. People would deny you the right to know Jesus Christ. People would deny you. They would, they would mistreat you or shut off that gospel message from you. But I'm here to tell you, God has a way to break down barriers. There's no communist country that has ever been able to keep him out. There's no atheistic society that could ever keep him in bed. Jesus just seems to touch those he wants to touch. He reveals himself to those he wants to reveal himself. And no man has yet been able to stop him. It is we who are good about the denial. But it is God who is good about breaking down our barriers and saying, no, I want them too. And I don't think the world just needs to learn that lesson. I think the church does too. I think if God's arms are open for everybody, then I think the doors of the church ought to be open for everybody. Why should we deny them access? Because we don't like it. That sounds like what Jesse did. Not worthy to come. Don't even invite him. That's a bad policy and that's a bad, bad way to handle everything. This young man was an elementary school dropout. His family could not finance his education past elementary school. So, what chance do you give a kid that didn't even finish his school? Well, not bad. He picked up a lot of books. Learned a lot of stuff, invented the lightning rod, spectacles, and helped form this nation that we're a part of. Because Benjamin Franklin, he educated himself. You won't even deny him greatness with the desire to learn that was within him. Preference was shown. Prejudice was shown. Presumption was shown in David's life and so many others' life. Why do we presume what God will do? See, here's God's perspective. You think you're smart. I'm 
this morning. Think you got it all figured out? Hmm. I'll show you. In fact, here's his promise, and I love seeing it. I believe God has shown that in our country time and time again, and I believe in all countries of the world in some regard. But I love how God says in the New Testament, Paul brings this out, that God will take the foolishness of the world. You think it's dumb. You think it's idiotic. You think it's crazy. God says, I'll pick that up. I'll use it, and I'll show my wisdom through it. I don't need your preferences. I'll choose whom you will deny. I'll choose whom you wouldn't pick. And I'll show my greatness in how I do that. I believe we need to quit this odd man out, John. I believe we need to quit telling God who can do His will, who is available. I believe we need to treat our families as if, and our neighbors as if God cares about every one of them and stop presuming, stop being prejudiced, and start holding our own preferences and let God be God of everybody that He has created on this planet. I'm one of them. I'm not over them. I don't want a Jesse heart. I want a heart that says, whomever God is. Whomever God wants. So let's stop the oddness and let's start the doing. Because I think God's church needs to move forward. And I think we don't need to be sitters. I think we need to be doers. And I think there's people that have been sidelined, pushed to the side, put against. But I think they need to be brought forward. Because I believe what changes the odd man out to the doers is something called determination. Now, let me, let me explain that. I'm not talking about human determination. Because that, that's very American. I'm, got, I'm determined. I'm going to do it. Pull myself up by my own bootstrap. I'm going to do it myself. That's not the determination I'm talking about. I'm talking about God's determination. And His determination is, I'm going to see this through no matter what. God's determination is, this is my will. And it will be done. When God looked at Eliab, the firstborn, God determined, nope, not him. And for six other brothers, no, 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 no. He didn't think about it. He didn't have to wonder about it. He says no. And he explains to Samuel, why? Because Samuel in his mind is saying, God, are you kidding me? Look how tall he is. Look how strong he is. Look how smart this one is. Look at all of these. God, why? He says, Samuel, you're looking on the outside. Look at that guy on the throne. What was he picked for? What was on the outside? He's taller than everybody else. He's strong. He knows how to fight. Everybody loves him until he went crazy. Because he never had my heart. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. I have looked at their hearts, and they are not my choice. He determined none of them. But when David was called, that's why I highlighted that. When David was coming up, we have his appearance laid out there. But you know what? He didn't say because he was handsome, because he was ruddy, because he was young. None of those things were listed. When Samuel said in there, the Lord said, this is the one. This is mine. I've looked on him inside and out. He is my choice. That's God's determination. It's not Jesse's choice. It's not Samuel's choice. And it will not be Israel's choice because, well, they're Israel. But he was God's choice. This young man wasn't a really choice of a lot of his teachers either. I'm not. We all fail teachers. All of us do. But he didn't speak a word until he was four years old. I mean, hello? He couldn't even speak till way later. And his elementary school teachers considered him lazy because he would ask all these weird questions, abstract questions that they couldn't even understand. So for them, mm -mm, didn't look like he was going to amount to anything. <clears throat> then he came up with this thing called the theory of relativity. And everybody kind of learned his name. I mean, when you conquer calculus and you're 15 years old, you're a master at it already, you kind of get a lot of people's attention. It's like he was born to be brilliant. Understand what I'm saying? He didn't learn it. He didn't glean it. He was born to be that way. God put something in him that allowed him to see what it still is hard time seeing for a lot of scientists today. It's hard, but God put that in humankind because God has made a determination on every heart, in every life. God has a plan. God has a will. 
I think we ought to let him do it. And I pray people believe it enough to want it. Here's where the commentary comes in, Psalm 78. Psalm 78 says, God rejected the tent of Joseph. He did not choose the tribe of Ephraim. Now that's very strong language. If you remember the history of Israel, the firstborn was Reuben. He blew it. And he just blew being a firstborn. No need to get into that one. So Jacob, having the firstborn of his beloved wife, well, that was the natural, that was the natural thing to do. So Joseph and Ephraim was one of his sons. Joseph takes the ascendancy. In fact, their tribes began, the whole northern tribe of Israel, all the tribes of there, began to be known as Ephraim because of how big Joseph and Ephraim was in that area. Manasseh was the other son. So it, it comprised so much of that area and so many of the tribes of Israel. But in Psalm 78, it says God overlooked Joseph. That's that you don't say. You read the end of Genesis, how Jacob felt about him. Oh boy, he lauded him with blessing and praises. But God looked over the track of history of Joseph and he didn't see what he wanted to see. He didn't see coming out what he wanted to see. Ephraim, same way. He saw the fourthborn. You understand me? Fourthborn out of twelve. You just kind of mixed in the middle. So for all you middle children, you can understand here, you're somewhere in the middle. The first one gets the attention, the last one gets the attention, but poor you people in the middle. You just kind of stuck there. Judah was the fourthborn of the unloved wife. That doesn't sound like a very good position to be in, but here's what the psalmist picked up about God's choice. He rejected the tent of Joseph. He did not choose the tribe of Ephraim. But he chose the tribe of Judah. He chose this tribe. He chose this people and he wasn't done in 70. He says he chose David his servant and took him from the sheepfolds. God knew where he got him from. You see, God had met him in the sheepfolds. There was something going on between David and God in the sheepfolds. And I don't know what the sheep got out of it, but God found man after his own heart. And that's what he was looking for in a countryside of no consequence to anybody but God. God said, I choose you. So David was God's determination. But David also became quite the overcomer. Doesn't matter what people think about you when God's chosen you. Amen. Doesn't matter what your family thinks about you when God chose you. It doesn't matter what your church thinks about you when God chose you. It doesn't matter what anybody, including yourself, thinks about you. What matters is what does God say about you? What is God determined for your life? Because if your life is all your own making, I'm sorry for you. I'm sorry. Because you are living way under your potential. I don't care if you're one of the richest men on earth, because most rich, the richest men on earth, none of them that I know of know the Lord Jesus Christ. They're looking really good in this life, but they sure are holding a lot to those millions and billions. I wonder what they think they're going to do with them. Because they're not taking them with them. And obviously, those millions and billions don't keep them married. It doesn't help them in their relational life or in their physical life. So I'm wondering, you have power for a moment, but you sure are going to release it and never hold it again once you breathe your last. So be self-made. What does it get you? It only gets you the world. But when God chooses, it's not just for time. It's for eternity. He chose David to be his pick. This cartoonist was not picked. In fact, he was fired from a newspaper because they didn't like his artistic work. And he came to them with an idea, a new, a new cartoon character, and they said, no, that'll scare the ladies. Well, he made Steamboat Willie anyway. You know what? I think a couple of people have heard about Walt Disney now. I think, not him, but goodness, his company, they own about everything now. But one thing that ties them all together is imagination put on display. And it started not with a company. It started with a man who says, I don't care if you fire me. I will find a way to bring entertainment to the families of this country that in hard times of the 20th century needed those breaks, needed those times, and well, the rest is history. Let me finish David's history. David is said of in Psalm 78, 71 and 72, 
This is important for us going forward. If we're going to be doers, it doesn't matter where we come from. Put that to the side. It doesn't matter what people say. It doesn't matter how we're overlooked, disrespected, and denied. How are we going to move forward and do God's will? We have the key here in 71 and 72. God chose him from following the ewes that the young, had, he brought him. He brought him from doing those sheep, from leading those sheep to shepherd Jacob, his people, and Israel, his heritage. God told David, and God would use to David, David, I appreciate all the many hours you put in with these sheep. They're sheep. They're dumb. They don't get along. They jump in the wolf's mouth if you give them half a chance. They like to wander off. They don't like to listen to you. You have to tap them and keep them in line. You're going to have to fight for them because they will run away very easily. David, that's not your life. That's just your training ground. That's not what you're going to be. That doesn't define you. That just equips you. You have shepherded sheep so well. Now you have a bigger challenge. I want you to shepherd my people. Because they're hard-headed. They don't listen. They will run off and give them half a chance. They will jump into the devil's mouth if you give them a chance. I need you to shepherd my people Israel. That is your destiny. That is what I have determined for you to do. And it says, He shepherded them. I love this part. I love it. It's not like God made it and David was just blessed. David put something into it. He had to take God's trust, take God's pick, and do something with it. It says, He shepherded them according to the integrity of His heart. I want to say, Jesse, did you not see the integrity of your own son's heart? Brothers, did you not see the integrity of your brother's own heart? You may have left him, but he didn't complain about it. He went to Goliath and says, why is this big bunch of nothing defying our God? And you say, what are you doing here? You just want to think that they didn't do a brotherly kind of... Didn't you see his integrity? He had more courage in his little pinky than you had in the whole army of Israel because all of them were sitting on their duff doing nothing with somebody defying God. And he said, if y'all won't do it, then God and this little shepherd boy will take out the one who thinks he's bigger than God. And you know what? That shepherd boy was right. God says, you shepherd them according to the integrity of your heart. And it says he guided them with the skillfulness of his hands. David put his heart into God's work. And it was a good heart. Failed, human, absolutely. But God saw all in all, it was a heart of integrity. A heart that would follow him and listen to him, and he did. And then use the skills that he learned. You fight that lion, you're going to fight the devil. <laughs> You, you, you fought that bear, you're going to fight the, the enemies of Israel. You're going to fight them. And he was skillful in everything he did. Solomon had the greater glory, but Solomon never would have had a throne were it not for his father David, who did the hard work to get him there. That's why he's praised in Psalms 78 instead of Solomon. He, according to the integrity of his heart and the skillfulness of his hands, he was used by God. Now, let me bring this New Testament since as we bring this to a close. God told, or Jesus told His disciples in John 15, 16, this is for you and for me too. I don't care how many times you've been overlooked. I know it hurts. It'll still hurt if somebody does it too. And sometimes you may find your preacher overlooks you. I don't mean to. But I mean, everybody does it from time to time. But can I tell you, God has never overlooked you. God knows your name. God knows your determination. I'll tell you, some people aren't living up to what He wants you to live up to. He has greater plans than you have for yourself. You just have to trust Him. You just have to put your heart of integrity and say, I will. I am willing. I will use my hands and my heart to do your will. Jesus looked at His disciples on the night before He was crucified. And this is such a powerful word. I never saw it in this way, but I want to share it with you. Jesus told His disciples, You did not choose Me. Did you hear me? You know what? I'm right there with them. I didn't choose Him. They didn't choose Him. Peter was minding his own business and Jesus got all up in his business. Matthew was doing
doing his own thing. Jesus got up in his business. He says, you didn't choose me. In fact, nobody did. They did a good job of rejecting him. Nobody chose him. You know, that could be, that could be a, a statement that ends in bitterness, couldn't it? You didn't choose me, so we'll get back at you. You didn't choose me, so I'm going to show you. You didn't choose me, so I'm going to hold a grudge against you for life. That's not Jesus' message here. Jesus says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. And I chose you in exactly the way he chose David. Let me finish the verse. He says, I chose you and I have appointed. In other words, I have determined for you to produce fruit. And that that fruit should remain. And whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. You don't know the privilege you've got. You don't know what I've chosen you for. You've been trying to fish. You've been trying to tax collect. You've been trying to do it on your own. But I've opened up access to the Father in heaven. You can come in and this world is going to change when you see what I do through you. God's choice made all the difference. Going back to David. You see, David's brothers and David's fathers only saw a shepherd. God saw a king. They only saw a boy. God saw a man after his own heart. They only saw him as worthless. God said, he is worthy. They said, just leave him out in the fold. God says, bring him here. He is my leader. You see, it doesn't matter how overlooked you are. Because God has determined great things for you if you will let Him. And I don't think just we need to know it. I think the world needs to know it. As you bow your heads and ponder this, I have one thing to share with you before we close. Millions saw the other night during the Billboard Awards. I don't watch the Billboard Awards because I don't like most of the things that come out of their mouths. To be honest with you. I don't. Lauren Daigle got up on the stage. And I want you to listen to the words that she sang so skillfully to all of the world, and really all, all of America and all of the world. Here's the words she said. You say, she said, I keep fighting voices in my mind that say I'm not enough. Every single lie that tells me I will never measure up. Am I more than the sum of every high and every low? Remind me once again just who I am because I need to know. You say I am loved when I can't feel a thing. You say I am strong when I think I'm weak. You say I am held when I am falling short. When I don't belong, you say I am yours. And I believe. I take all I have and I lay it at your feet. You have every failure, God. And you'll have every victory. I believe what you say of me. I believe. What you say of me. I think God is telling even a forlorn world that in a lot of ways has turned their back on God. I'm still willing to change your future. Your past is the past. I can forgive that. I want to change your future. I want to change you to quit thinking about what others say and even use yourself say. And I want you to hear what I say to you. This is what I say. Now, do we believe? <laughs> do we believe? Would you stand with me?